local trinity. Night after night I'd watch him, insist upon tossing a pair of blank dice and snapping his fingers, hissing, what are the odds, what are the odds, what are the odds? And then the perfume of the moon would linger in the air, echoing, what are the odds, what are the odds? Night after night I'd watch him, and I'd remark, this is strictly none of my business there, but are you aware those are blank dice? <laughs> he regarded this, and simply remarked, doesn't change the game or the odds. And that you're not just another ugly American addicted behind the wheel, looking for action, the short thing, the big deal. We're going to end up and settle for the rind, the peel, the squeal. He had been a wannabe so long that the never was in him grew curious to whatever happened to that tired old has been. Want to see where the wannabe lingered too long getting around to informing the never was to look up that tired old has-been and have a little fun with his ass? Want to know where the wannabe was elevated to the status of a has-been after being allowed to skip the never was designation altogether? It happened that night when the never was ran into the has-been and gathered him together with fistful by the lapels and snarled, who never was? And he wasn't quite finished yet. However, with their jaws inches apart, he said, Listen, I was a nobody before you were even thinking, wannabe, and my has-been will see your dick in the dirt. So what are the odds? What are the odds? Some night, you'll see them down the end of the bar. The three of them stroll in on the perfume of the moon, the wannabe buying them all around, while the never was fishes those dice out of his pocket. But it's the has-been who's holding court with the bartender. And if you lean in a little closer, you can hear him say, of course the dice are blank. Why do you think they call them bones in the first place? And you better be off watching where you step, either on the way up or the way down, because you'll never know who have heard these footsteps. Yeah, footsteps. They echo, you know. It's like this on the perfume of the moon. If you can remember where, when, you can remember how now. said not to explain. <laughs> Talking in punchlines. There he is again, son of a bitch, standing up there looking like a busted in light bright. Puss in a squid, or early release, promising to break out the most holy id. So when he started talking in punchlines, down at the end of the bar one night, nary an eyebrow was raised. So, how many do you think it'll take him tonight? Five. One to steer, one to work the pedals, two to push and use the seat under the uh, hood and go vroom, vroom. I won't come in your mail. Renta cunta. Cunta kinta. Leprechaun. It's hard to tell. They keep slipping down the drain. Six. One to change the light bulb and five to write the environmental report. A spigot. A spigot. Why? Why do you want to know? Because they'll honk the horn, squeal the tires, and play the radio too loud all the way to the moon. They go forward, they go backward, and when they go flat, they go wop, 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 wop. <laughs> no doubt about this, that butted popcorn wasn't bad either. The difference, one you shuck between fits and the other you tippy, barry, curry, Seymour, heat, muffy, patience, sandy. Oh yes you can, said the farmer, you just can't understand him. He said there are more fucking geese there you can shake a stick at. I don't know, said the parrot, I got hard and fell off my perch. Okay. <laughs> About this point, you're going, what the hell is going on? Is there any poetry in half a joke? What does this revelation have to be like discovering carpet tacks stuck in the finger holes of bowling balls as prose? Mm -hmm. You want to roll with this. You really, but what are you left with? Carpet tacks? Punch lines? A ten pin split? Poetry? Okay. This is what you really lift one. The short end of a sharp, shitty stick poke at you from an ordinary every little prick. And you just don't forget, I may break out the almost holy id. But if it ever came to this, if you knew the entire routine, would you feel better this evening? The newlyweds stopped at a bed and breakfast room for the night. At noon the next day, they still hadn't gotten up, so the landlady calls up to the room to announce the last call for breakfast. Says, don't worry about us, yelled the groom. We're living on the fruits of love. <laughs> Fine, screams the farmer, but stop throwing the God's damn skins out the window in the pond. They're choking the ducks. <laughs> 13. 
after work beers. Hot, hot, hot Wednesday night. Around quarter to seven after the 4th of July, a work crew in orange t-shirts into the bar for after work beers. Blacktop, I think, from the looks of them. The round went like this, three buds of a light and a Michelo. They're barely sedate. It's in fact a lifeless bunch of orange t-shirts. Not much to say, but come on, they're all pretty beat. Ever try spreading that stuff on your feet for an 11 hour day starting at 5 a.m.? Yeah, no surprise here, five sweaty men with five sweaty beers, speaking low to each other, hunched over, butts and ashtrays. They look depressed, ornery, and exhausted. And they have every right to be. After all, guess what they get to do tomorrow? <laughs> At one point, the foreman announces, come on, let's go get some chow. In a response, more than half of the crew drinks them off, leaves the bar, leaving only two guys behind. They decide to have one more. Every crew has its hardcore. <laughs> Still quoting Ron Swoboda. Anybody? Yeah. The quote, why am I putting so much effort into such a mediocre career? Anyway. <laughs> Listen, look, 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 look. Don't get involved with any of this poetry business if you think that you want money, recognition, encouragement, or sexual favors, or any of that crap. You'd be better off doing something useful and profitable. A plumber, for instance. That's right, hell yes, don't laugh. Nobody laughs at plumbers. They're very well respected. Hell, they're feared. They're too expensive. However, poets, <laughs> almost all poets, even the big ones, in fact, especially the really good big ones, live fairly miserable lives and were rarely successful in their own lifetime. And if it did, it fucked them up. And their heads got too big and nobody wanted any part of them. And the rest had their collected poems end up in the landfill library after their death. You know, you're a poet, huh? What are you, fucking nuts? <laughs> can, can you really, let me ask you a question. Can you really tell people with a straight face, I'm a poet? <laughs> Personally, on the rare occasion that I'm introduced to anybody as a poet, I'm barely certain they heard asshole instead. <laughs> Poets big week. Reading at the local community college with six people in the audience. Woman in the aisle of the supermarket who wants some of your poems for her daughter, who's in jail. Uh, the high school class you conducted a workshop on great American mediocre poets that you found fascinating. Phone call from a local celebrity offering you, offering you a paying gig five years too late. And local newspaper prints one of your poems with all the typos intact. Uh, discussion in the community is at large that you're a fucking moron. And yet you still refuse to give up. Or in the past week's events actually encouraged you to go plans with another self-published book, to follow up the wild indifference that greeted the first seven, go forward with that CD compilation of the past 15 years of generally ignored recorded poems. Now look, this fabulous obscurity has taken a lifetime to achieve. And I'd be more disappointed if I had ever really worked at any of it. Me too. I'm oh, sorry. Um, well, it leads in nicely. The alcoholic adjunct of the month club. <laughs> Bet you didn't know they had one. <laughs> that fall, they asked Dad, hey, Dad, what have you been up to? Oh, purchasing major appliances and flying off the handle of trivial things came to apply. Dad regrouped, said, fine. Now it's my turn. He thought, looking at him, why is it that talking to you is like dropping a jar of mayonnaise on a shag carpet? <laughs> Dad smoldered, that broken jaw at large. He's awaiting shipment any day now. Something's going to give liver, kidneys, lungs, gums, stroke, hell, take your pick. He's been working on it for years. In the meantime, run his tags, test his urine, recite that alphabet backwards. No jake breaks for Dad. He's not fooling anybody tonight down the end of the bar as usual with his $5.80 royalty check wrapped around the lamppost. So tip your hat or shoot him five. But let's talk with four eyes and get it straight. Dad hustled. And man, I mean hustled.
did it right. Always got to have one for Hank, Charles Burkowski. Uh, he's sort of fading a little bit at one time. He was thought to be this and that, but I still want this stuff. Without a doubt. Would Hank have to explain it to you? Man, would he ever look at you right now and say, you, my friend, are out of place, out of time, out of luck. The world is passing you by. If your audience ever existed, it is dwindling. And the others that are there are highly skeptical. Your old stomping grounds look like the Monday morning after the circus elephants broke camp in the carnival's trailer park. Better face it, kid. They don't hand out Burkowski breaks on street corners anymore. And if you don't get that through your thick skull of yours, you're finished. You're tuning your own horn. Nobody's digging the sound. If you had the guts, endurance, or talent, maybe. You're at least as ugly as I was. Little debate there. Oh, you drink a lot of beer, too. Splendid recommendation. But what'd you expect, anyway? A thousand loser poets use this smelly old fat ass to some sort of measuring stick? Believe this, you're better off trying to keep your wife and your kids close to you. Especially at the end. The end always being a little nearer than you might think. The finish always softens up the tough guys. No, Hank would only look at you and sadly and slowly and shake his head. And sure, you can buy the beer, but just don't try reading any of those poor shit poems of yours, all right? <laughs> I got it. I got my thing. Um, well, what the hell? Forty six. Mm -hmm. Holiday for non sequitur. Okay there for you, Mr. Peckerhead poet. Yeah, I know, if we had plenty of time to decode your cryptic contradictions trying to decipher that thin line you wind between bravado and bingo. G7. It, is that strange verbal lurching dance you schlep across the valscape of the phonic Bible romper room really all that important? How about just for tonight? You keep your piss and vinegar, your sentimental bullying, your paper wasp microphone, your information age road rage. How about for tonight, you stand with me in the marketplace, in this cyber vacuum, and try to see what I do. People who don't see each other anymore. The image pad think cripples. The society has been taken over to the fact that we are kind of archaic. The only thing that's real is electric and some other grid talks. We blindly stare at anyone who's not readily recognizable, codifiable, simplistic, one-dimensional, cardboard cutout of derivative contrived popular culture based reality and point fingers. And then we blend back into the shuffling trance where the drooling innuendo, lance dribble of primetime media induces cow-eyed, moronic, complacency and consumption. And then it's moo, baby. Moo. <laughs> hey, look, some of you haven't had an original thought in your head since Kramer was considered clever. Oh, did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> now you know how I feel. Just for tonight, suspend belief. Entertain the notion that this Debilitating diatribe is essential to your understanding of the operation of the brutal vending machine that we've made of the earth and on why certain nights I feel like the devil's playground located in the center of a third-rate small-time circus, whereupon all the rusted, battered amusement park rides are constructed by shaky and suspect picture sentences composed by blind drunk carnies at five in the morning. And guess Jews got a pocket full of free passes with your name on them for some rides. <laughs> Later in the evening, we can hit all the same old haunts, see all the same old faces, we can say the same old things. One time I did try this new place, though. It was upscale and snooty there at Dress Pro. Doorman eyed me with disapproval. He said, hey, you need a tie to get into this place. So I turned on my heel, went out to the car, got in the trunk, got a pair of mini jumper cables, fashioned them into a Windsor knot around my neck. 
marched back in the bar, presented myself to the bartender. <laughs> he regarded me for a full 30 seconds and finally let out a sigh to resign and says, all right, smart ass, go ahead in. And as I was going, he grabbed me and said, wait for it, don't try to start anything. <laughs> you had that coming.